Happy Friday, everybody. Although I guess by the time this video posts, it'll be Saturday, but James Hancock here just finished binging the new Netflix show, Altered Carbon, all 10 episodes. And for people who don't know, it's based on a 2002 novel of the same name by Richard K. Morgan. The book actually won the Philip K. Dick Award when it first came out, but this show is developed by screenwriter Leta Calagridis. Look her up. She's got a ton of screenplay credits. But as always, I'll be speaking in very broad general terms initially in case you don't want any spoilers, and then I'll give you fair warning before I dive into any specifics. I should say in advance that I have not read the novel, but even just in a TV show format with 10 episodes, this is an enormously rich, dense story with a hell of a lot of detail and a lot of intersecting storylines. But the best way to pitch it basically is that this is a classic film noir style whodunit that happens to take place very far in the future. If you're just looking for a really good hard-boiled detective story murder mystery Alter Carbon will absolutely deliver on that. But if you're also looking for a crazy sci-fi adventure story with super-powered action and sword fights, clones and shapeshifters and all sorts of crazy shit, Alter Carbon will also deliver on that front as well. I should also say when it comes to sex and violence, this show really pushes it. It's not just that it's violent and sexual, it's the level of detail and the level of variety when it comes to the sex and violence that I think a lot of people who are more... Um, who like their entertainment a little bit more G-rated, might be a little put off by just how extreme this show is. But now I was reading in reviews a couple days ago, a lot of people were condemning it for the fact that it's overly sexual, but I was like, well, shit, that sounds amazing. So I recognize that it's not for everybody, but it is definitely a type of show made with my dirty old man sensibilities in mind. When it comes to the moving image and cyberpunk, of course, everybody's immediately gonna say, is it better than or worse than Blade Runner? And the reality is Blade Runner is a movie that is so influential that when it comes to video games and comics and novels, it's one of the most influential stories told in the last half century. Granted, that was initially based on a Philip K. Dick short story, but the movie Blade Runner has become one of the most influential touchstones in pop culture of the last half century. It's going to be very hard to compare Altered Carbon favorably to Blade Runner. But if you want to compare it to Blade Runner 2049, I think it actually compares pretty favorably. I might even prefer Altered Carbon, while Blade Runner 2049 was this astonishing, visionary, just rich, beautiful, almost like sci-fi poem. Ultra Carbon's very much the reverse, where it's incredibly focused on the plot. Ultra Carbon's very story-driven, as opposed to emotionally and visually driven. So it's two very different experiences, but it's great that in the span of six months, we have two insanely good cyberpunk stories to choose from that we can debate and discuss. On the other hand, though, I don't want to oversell Ultra Carbon. Like any TV show that's 10 episodes long, you're going to have peaks and valleys. And some of these episodes, I really found myself struggling to remain totally engaged. And then a scene would come along that would be so amazing or so shocking or just so ballsy that it kind of shocked me out of my complacency and forced me to pay attention again. I don't necessarily recommend binging the show. I binged it because I wanted to go ahead and get a review up, but I have a feeling I probably would have enjoyed it more if I'd watched it a few episodes at a time to really savor all the details. So what the hell is the story of Ultra Carbon? Some of y'all might be asking at this point. It basically is a murder mystery that's set in the year 2384. And a character by the name of Kovach, who we initially believed to be kind of a terrorist or criminal figure, is brought out of cold storage in order to conduct an investigation into this latest mystery. The reason Kovach has been brought back to life, essentially, is because he used to be what's called an envoy. And these envoys are basically like superhuman soldiers who are designed to have their consciousness beamed around the universe where they can adapt to hostile environments. They have this incredible pattern recognition ability that gives them heightened senses. And he's the last of the envoys because the envoys were wiped out centuries ago when there was a virus that was introduced into their cortical stacks that everyone has in the back of their heads now. The cortical stack is basically a chip in the base of your spine that carries the DHF or the digital human freight. And the digital human freight is basically your memories. It's you. Basically, your body and your skin is nothing more than a sleeve. It is Your body is not who you are. You are basically your cortical stack you can actually have your memories and your personality removed, put in storage, much like a flash drive, and then you can be placed into another body. The only way someone can really truly die is if that little coracle stack is destroyed. But you have a situation now here in the future where sleeves are basically commodities. They're bought and sold for profit. But it can often be very tragic. Like early on, we see a little girl who was killed in a hit and run, and now she's placed into the sleeve of an old woman because her family can't afford one that's better. Basically, the poor 
find themselves in a situation where they will age out their sleeves and then find themselves placed in whatever comes up, whether it's 100 years, 200 years, and they're basically living off of the leftovers. The wealthy are in a very different situation. The wealthy are basically functionally immortal because not only can they afford the best sleeves, sleeves that are incredibly augmented, basically state-of-the-art technology, but they can also afford clones. And by transferring their stack from clone to clone, you can avoid the fragmentation of your personality and memories that happens over time. If somebody gets transplanted between too many bodies, it can basically make you go insane. And in a scenario where the wealthy never die, it allows them to continue growing their wealth and power over time to almost a limitless degree. So if you're poor, you're starting over every few centuries, whereas the wealthy just keep increasing the lead they have on the rest of society. And they basically live in the clouds like gods. And one of these astronomically wealthy individuals, Bancroft, he got killed and he wants to know why. When he was killed, they tried to kill a stack. However, he's so wealthy, he can afford every once in a while to have his memory shot up to a satellite where he's stored remotely, but he can't remember the last 48 hours because that backup only happens every so often. And so Kovach is brought in to figure out who might have killed him, why would they want to have him killed, and what happened to him in the interim between his last memory and when he awoke in a new body. Now, where the story goes from here has more twists and turns than I can properly summarize in a quick YouTube review, but it is quite a ride, and it takes you to very unpredictable terrain. And there are a variety of villains who come in and out of the story, and people who you think are protagonists become antagonists, and the reverse. It's incredibly complicated, but it actually does a really good job of actually coming full circle at the end so it never actually loses that film noir flavor. It reminded me a lot of Laura, the old Otto Preminger film from the 40s, where basically at the end you have the, all the characters in one room basically dissecting and tearing apart the plot to figure out what actually happened. And it was incredibly reassuring and classic in that sense. So I do think that this show will find an audience, but it's not going to be for everybody, like I said. Some people would just be turned off by the fact that this is hardcore sci-fi for hardcore sci-fi nerds. And there'll be plenty of other people who just find it to be way too sex crazed and way too violent. It'll probably make them feel a little queasy while watching it. Overall, before I get into any actual specific details, I'll just say I would rate this show as incredibly solid. Is it on the level of a show like Westworld? It's probably not quite on Westworld's level. But is it on the level of a show like The Expanse? Definitely. I think it's equal to The Expanse, perhaps even a little bit better. So if you're a sci-fi junkie, Altered Carbon is absolutely required viewing. And even if you're not a sci-fi junkie and you just like a good whodunit, I also recommend it. But just recognize going into it that the show is not without its flaws and it has some characters who are less interesting and some subplots that are less interesting and some episodes like episode 7, which probably should have been removed entirely. I mean, I was joking to myself as I was watching it. It seems like a lot of shows have a weak episode 7 and I feel like... They should just have TV shows now where it's almost like floors of a building in Manhattan where you go from floor 12 to floor 14 and you skip 13 entirely. And I just feel like every single show should just shoot and write their shows like normal and just take episode 7 and throw it out and then post the shows online. Perhaps I'm being a little unfair because episode 7 does have some crucial details to the plot, but basically the show grinds to a halt to fill in a lot of backstory, and if you were to remove it entirely, you would just have a much tighter, more focused narrative. That's all I'm going to say when it comes to broad strokes. Definitely check out the show, but let's talk about some specifics. So with a show as rich and dense and textured as this one, there's no way I'm going to discuss all the details that I both loved and disliked, but I do want to call attention to a few details because I was blown away frequently while watching this show. First and foremost, the look of the show is absolutely outstanding. It reminded me a lot of Blade Runner. Maybe that's a bad thing because it does have that classic kind of rain-drenched trench coat neon look that so many cyberpunk stories have to this day. I mean, once again, the influence and the shadow of Blade Runner is very, very large, and it's very hard for a show like this to escape the outright influences of Blade Runner when it comes to the overall visual aesthetic. But the world building here is just incredible. The level of detail we get into, the different societies and the like paramilitary factions and the police force and underground fight scenes and the criminality and just the weird, crazy, dark, evil shit that the super wealthy get up to. I mean, there's a business in this show called Head in the Clouds, and Head in the Clouds is basically, it's Cloud City from Empire Strikes Back. It almost looks identical to it, and there's a shot at the very end of the show where somebody drops from Head in the Clouds, which is almost identical to Luke Skywalker trying to escape from his father, Darth Vader, after he's had his hand removed. But at Head in the Clouds, 
the super wealthy go up there to do the most disgusting shit imaginable, whether it's rape or murder or perversions or S&M or a combination of all the above. And I'm going to be speaking very graphically moving forward. So if you're not into this kind of discussion, definitely turn off the video now because one of the prostitutes offers a service where you can literally take a knife and carve holes in her and have sex with the holes because the whole idea is they're going to be paid so much and they can always, even if they die, they can have their cortical stack placed into another body. It basically allows the super wealthy to do whatever they want. The mystery of the show really begins and ends in this place head in the clouds. Bancroft went a little bit crazy up there and as a result murdered a girl but because the girl is a new Catholic, Catholics have a situation where the law prevents you from removing their stack and interrogating them in a virtual environment or putting them in a new body because they believe that if you do so, their spirit can't go to heaven. And so the fact that this girl is unable to speak on her behalf is one of the few things protecting Bancroft's reputation. But some of the things that the super wealthy get up to in this movie is not just limited to sexual perversion. Like there's one woman at a party where she has a snake that she wears as a decoration just as a way of demonstrating her power and her wealth. She had a murderer rapist, their mind, placed inside the snake so that she can wear him for the rest of her life. Some might say, well, he's a rapist and a murderer. Who cares what happens to him? But there's a situation in the show where the rich are constantly pushing what they're allowed to do, both within the law and outside of it. And they're so old and they're so powerful and they're so bored, they feel like no laws or morality apply to them anymore. And the Bancroft family, they're this classic dysfunctional family because the husband and wife who are the patriarch and matriarch of the family, because they never die, their wealth and power will never be passed down to their children. So their children, even if, they're, even if they're 60 or 70 years old, are in this permanent state of arrested development. But the wife, Miriam Bancroft, she is an absolutely fascinating femme fatale. She's very old, but incredibly sexy. She's always tempting Kovach with sex. She actually even succumbs to it at one point, but she's tempting with the idea of having like an orgy with all of her clones simultaneously. The stuff that the show explores when it comes to sexu sexuality and technology combined, the only comparison I can think of that's going on right now is something like Black Mirror, where they're willing to explore some of these scenarios that we might encounter if you take technology and basically look toward the future with a critical eye. The children are so envious of Mrs. Bancroft, even her daughter, her 12th child who's 67, she'll do things where she'll have her cortical stack placed into a clone of her mother and take her mother's body for a test drive having sex with somebody because she's jealous of the fact that her mother's body is so state-of-the-art and superior to her own. And if this sounds like a show that's just geared towards fueling the masturbatory fantasies of adolescent males, there's plenty of male nudity in this as well. The star Joel Kinnaman, who I only knew previously from Robocop and Suicide Squad, he's nude like half the show because he's having relationships with all these different people, including a cop by the name of Ortega. And their relationship is actually one of the few wholesome sexual aspects of the show, but there's still nudity aplenty on that front. And I've got a question for people out there when it comes to male nudity in TV shows. And I feel like this has been pointed out a lot with Game of Thrones, but when it comes to mature shows like Game of Thrones or Ultra Carbon, they have a lot of fr full frontal male nudity, but it's always with guys who are very flaccid and soft. And I don't know if there's like an unwritten rule where if you actually show an erect penis that like gets you banned from TV or the internet. I mean, obviously there's plenty of porn online where you see erections, but it seems like when it comes to film and television, I can think of almost no examples in history where you actually see an erection. Not that like my life is incomplete if I can't see one, but with the abundance of full frontal female nudity in this, it just seems weird that in every situation where a guy's naked as well, he has to look like he's been standing in the rain on a very cold day. So he might have to come up with a social media campaign like hashtag free the erection or something like that moving into the future for equal opportunity when it comes to depictions of sexuality in TV shows. But when it comes to nudity in the show, there's one scene that tops them all where it basically was like a shot of adrenaline to the side of my head, the main villain of the show. And if you haven't seen this show and you don't want spoilers, please bail, bail out now because the plot's so complicated. I kind of have to zigzag and jump around. I can't go through it sequentially. When we learn that Kovac's sister, Ray, is actually the main villain of the show, she's this astonishingly sexy Asian woman, but she basically takes on Ortega, her brother's girlfriend, in this fight that I'm still trying to wrap my head around just how insane it is, but basically 
she's completely nude and every single time that Ortega kills one of her bodies, she another one of her bodies will be activated and will leap through a window and engage her in combat. And so you basically have a situation where Ortega is just laying waste to all these incredibly beautiful naked women, all of whom look identical. So it's like an insane fight scene, but it's also almost borderline humorous because of all these identical beautiful bodies that are just falling down dead one after another. And I have to admit, after the very slow episode seven, I was really struggling to remain engaged in the show. And then this scene came along and I was like oh my fucking god what the hell am i watching this is insane but this show has a lot of scenes like that where you really sit upright and it forces you to pay attention early on i believe it was in episode four it's basically a one long torture sequence kovach has been captured by some of his enemies and the reason they've captured him is because the sleeve that he is in is guilty of some actions that these guys are pissed off about and they decide they're going to torture him and get a confession or get some information out of him but because of his envoy training he's able to withstand it but like they're cutting off his legs and they're catching him on fire and they're ripping out his fingernails i mean it's some horrific brutal shit but when he uses his envoy training to finally break free and he starts just laying waste to this giant torture chamber he has this insane gun where it shoots a projectile when it hits something it comes back out and goes back out into his gun and this killer rock music kicks in and he just goes to work fucking these people up and it's an absolutely insane scene to behold but the action in this show i mean i can't believe i haven't actually discussed the action yet in this show because whether it's hand-to-hand -hand combat or swords or gunfire they really spared no expense when it came to the action if you are a fan of shoot 'em ups or hand-to-hand -hand combat and decapitations and every form of violence imaginable you're going to see a, an example of it at some point and maybe i have situations with like husband wife death fights where whoever loses gets a downgrade on their body and whoever wins gets an upgrade or you have a scene in this another death match where Ortega and Kovach had to take on these human animal hybrids like human slash rhino. I mean, it's completely insane. You also have this crazy assassin character named the Ghost Walker who really truly does worship the wealthy as if they're actual gods. He thinks that the gods have been silent for centuries, but now they're actually listening. But he has this weapon that's like this knife that extends with like a star pattern and it comes in and just rips out giant chunks of flesh. But he's a total psycho. He even like murders children and people's families. I mean, he's a truly loads some human being but he makes a great villain working for Ray. And what's cool is seeing how Kovach, even though he likes to think of himself as this loner who doesn't even really want to live, he slowly starts assembling this team of friends and allies. I mean, his main ally, Ortega, she's cool as shit, but at one point, she loses an arm due to a fight with the Ghost Walker and ends up getting it replaced with like a cybernetic, state-of-the-art, badass arm that's super strong, so she's cool as shit. You also have Vernon Elliott, who becomes a great wingman, but Vernon Elliott, he has his own crazy subplot where his daughter was so horribly abused and such, har such atrocities were inflicted upon her that in the digital world she's been driven completely insane and we have a scenario where an ai hotel who called the raven who has uh, an avatar in the form of edgar Allan poe i mean his hotel's crazy and it has all these like machine guns that are like an extension of his body but he manages in a digital fashion to meet up with vernon's daughter lizzie and over time trains her to be this like super badass warrior with knives and guns as a way of dealing with her trauma so she can actually have like a healthy outlet for all the horrible things that are inflicted upon her and watching her evolution from just a scared shrieking girl to this like badass superhuman whose consciousness is finally placed in the body of a synthetic human being who can make her body basically shift and grow and change in a variety of ways she's not a huge part of the story but her arc is absolutely fascinating if you're a fan of like comic books and sci-fi and so on and so forth so if i'm making it sound like like there's just a bunch of violence and mayhem and sex to enjoy every step of the way. That is absolutely not the case. There's plenty of stuff that is a little tedious, a little boring. Like Ortega, when it comes to her inner office politics at the police station, a lot of those characters are pretty dry, pretty thin, and it almost feels like a routine, generic police thriller at times. I found myself getting pretty bored pretty quickly with a lot of the scenes where Ortega's not interacting with Kovach. We also get some pretty lengthy debates with, Orte with Ortega's family about spirituality and whether or not Catholics should allow themselves to die or if it's ethical to have their cortical stacks removed and placed in other bodies. And while this is an important part of the plot, especially when it comes to a law that may or may not be passed that will allow dead Catholics to testify about their own murders, the debates just run on a little bit longer perhaps than I would have liked. And maybe this is all because I, d I binged the show as opposed to watching standalone episodes, but some of those lengthy debates about Catholicism, etc., start to feel a little excessive and over overly long. But in the end, what really sells me on this show is the relationship between Kovach and his sister Ray. I mean, these are 
two young Asian children who are separated very early on. Kovacs goes off to become a soldier, finally returns to his own body. And the two of them end up joining the special team of envoys where they're being trained by their kind of spiritual and martial arts guru, Quell. And Quell's a very important character in their development. But Kovacs and his sister, they develop in very different ways. And whereas Ray decides she's going to devote her life to becoming incredibly wealthy, incredibly powerful, running a criminal empire, Kovacs develops in a way where he is absolutely opposed to the very same type of person that his sister is becoming. But at the same time, they still are incredibly close. And Ray, more than anything, wants her brother to be at her side helping her running her criminal empire. But you get into this very strange, weird, territorial, possessive, almost incestuous territory. And I think that Kovacs and Ray might have one of the most complicated brother-sister relationships that I've ever seen in any movie. I mean, you can maybe make a comparison to Gladiator or Joaquin Phoenix and his sister have a very strange, eerie, like kind of codependent relationship. But this show explores it in far greater depth and detail. For the film buff in me, this show did something insanely cool. And I didn't even notice it initially until we got to about episode four or five. But it names each episode after very famous film noir. You've got episode names like out of the Past, which stars Robert Mitchum, which is one of the all-time great film noirs by Jacques Teneur. But you also have like obscure ones like Force of Evil starring John Garfield, which I really thoroughly enjoy. And that's one of uh, Martin Scorsese's personal favorites. You got In a Lonely Place starring Humphrey Bogart, which is a film noir about screenwriting, which might be... I mean, I'm always saying that might be my favorite film noir. I have a lot that are competing for that top slot, but In a Lonely Place is certainly the film noir that I've seen probably more than any other. And then you got even more obscure references like Clash by Night, directed by Fritz Lang, which has Marilyn Monroe and a very strange S&M relationship that is reflected in a lot of the scenes in this show. And last but not least, you also have The Killer, starring the great Ava Gardner, who's one of the sexiest women who ever appeared in movies. So if you are a film noir fan, this show definitely has film noir on the brain and is doing everything in its power to live up to that incredibly rich cinematic heritage. At any rate, this review is becoming almost as long as one of the episodes of the show. It's time to wrap this sucker up. I think you can tell from the enthusiasm in my voice that I thoroughly enjoyed Ultra Carbon. I had an absolute blast watching it. I've got plenty of nitpicky criticisms. I have plenty of grievances, but overall, Netflix continues to be the most reliable source of kick-ass content out there, whether it's TV shows or movies, and I'm just 100% in their corner watching them experiment in all these exciting new ways. I think we're rapidly going to reach a point where every weekend, Netflix will have one or two movies and one or two new shows and if a lot of the other studios don't up their game you might find people who watch netflix and nothing else so i hope you enjoyed my reaction review if you found it helpful or useful or insightful please consider giving my channel a subscribe or even if you even if you did not find the video helpful or useful or insightful please consider giving my channel a subscribe if you want to talk more you can give me a shout on twitter at colbrax or you can always leave a comment in the comments below but if you don't want to watch this show in its entirety and you just want to see all the juicy bits i have a feeling the website mrskin.com is going to be getting a lot of traffic due to this show in the days and weeks to come when it comes to sex and science fiction i can think of few examples that are more tantalizing than altered carbon so on that note i'm going to wrap this video up Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Have an amazing weekend, and I'll be back at y'all Sunday night to review the latest Star Trek. Talk to you soon.